Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Good evening. According to the International Organization for Migration, in 2017, there have been 157,689 arrivals to Europe via a range of routes across Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, with an estimated 2,824 dead or missing on Mediterranean routes. There are many more people crossing state borders across the world, including over 600,000 Rohingya, estimated to have crossed into Bangladesh, and hundreds of thousands of people fleeing violence in the Central African Republic. Some people crossing borders are categorized as refugees, while others are not. UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, states on its website that, and I quote, migrants are fundamentally different from refugees and thus are treated very differently under international law. Though it explains that migrants and refugees increasingly make use of the same routes and means of transport to get to an overseas destination, it adds, again quoting, that migrants, especially economic migrants, choose to move in order to improve their lives, while refugees, it says, are forced to flee to save their lives or preserve their freedom. Is the UNHCR right to claim that migrants are fundamentally different from refugees? If so, how is the distinction to be drawn and why exactly does it matter? What is the relationship between migration and refugeehood? And what does this mean for internally displaced people? Is the existing legal definition of a refugee fit for purpose? And what might be the implications of seeking to modify that definition? I'm Sarah Fine from the Department of Philosophy at King's College London. And with me to debate these pressing issues, we have a fantastic panel, and I'll introduce them now. Ahmad al-Rashid is an author, Syrian campaigner, and violence, conflict, and development postgraduate at SOAS, and is now working for the International Organization for Migration. You may recognize him from the extraordinary BBC documentary, Exodus, Our Journey to Europe, with footage shot by refugees en route to Europe, and which followed Ahmad on his own long and dangerous journey to the UK. And Exodus is now available on iPlayer. Philip Cole, at the end, is a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at the University of the West of England, Bristol. His books include Philosophies of Exclusion, Liberal Political Theory and Immigration, The Myth of Evil, and with Christopher Heath Wellman, Debating the Ethics of Immigration. He's also co-editor of the recent collection, Understanding Statelessness, and is a wonderful model and inspiration for those like me who study the ethics of migration. Elspeth Guild is John Monet Professor Ad Personam at Queen Mary University of London, Professor of European Migration Law at the University of Nijmegen in Netherlands, and is a partner in the immigration team at the London law firm Kingsley Napley. She regularly teaches lawyers and judges in the EU about issues of EU borders and migration law, and acts as an expert on immigration issues for organizations such as the Council of Europe, UNHCR, the European Commission and Parliament, the House of Commons, and the House of Lords. Thank you for joining us. So I'd like to begin our discussion tonight with a brief outline of the legal landscape, as we'll need to have some picture of that before we can consider any problems with existing definitions and practices. So I'm going to start with our legal expert and ask for a sense of the current state of play. So Elspeth, can you tell us about the core of the international legal definition of a refugee? And could you also explain for us the differences between an asylum seeker and a refugee, and also outline the pathways to being formally recognized as a refugee? 
Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, if we start with the question of who is a refugee, the question is wonderfully well defined because we have an international convention, the UN Refugee Convention from 1951, widely ratified by states across the world and which defines who is a refugee. So a refugee is someone who is outside his or her country of nationality as opposed to a, an internally displaced person and who has a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, membership of a social group, or political opinion. Now, that definition sounds very straightforward, and what those who fulfill the definition are entitled to is they are entitled to what's called non refoulement and that is the right not to be sent to a place where they fear persecution under the convention. So we have quite a clear definition. We have an obligation on states in respect of refugees who arrive in their territory. And the question is, where is the problem? The problem really arises, first of all, in definitions. How do we define what is persecution? We know from the fairly recent past that even fairly simple terms in international law, like what is torture, can become highly disputed among liberal democracies. We have the question of the nexus. The person has to be persecuted on the basis of the, one of the five grounds. What are those five grounds? And in the convention itself, there are a number of grounds for exclusion. So even if someone fulfills the requirements, they may be excluded on grounds of national security, <coughs> usually defined broadly in terms of terrorism, war crimes, etc. When refugees arrive, they leave their country of origin where they fear, fear persecution, they arrive in another country. The authorities of that country need to receive an application from them, they need to claim protection, and the authorities need an opportunity to assess whether the person is indeed a refugee or whether the person does not, in fact, fulfill the criteria and then perhaps does not need international protection. And so states have created the terminology of the asylum seeker. A refugee is a refugee from the moment the conditions come into being. It's a bit like, am I a citizen or am I not a citizen? I'm a citizen from the moment that I'm born a citizen, and if I have documents or not, that's another matter. A refugee is somewhat in the same position, is a refugee from the moment the conditions are fulfilled, but states say, well, we need to assess whether the conditions are fulfilled, and that, during that period, the refugee is termed an asylum seeker. The story of the refugee doesn't end in 1951 or with the widening of the convention in 1967, but the international community has been particularly anxious to protect people who fear persecution and torture. And in 1984, a new UN convention was opened, the Convention Against Torture, which includes this non-refoulement principle, you cannot return someone to a country where he or she fears, uh, um, where there's a real risk the person will suffer in torture. <coughs> 1984 isn't the end of the story because we also have in 2006 the UN Convention on the Prohibition of Enforced Disappearances, where once again we introduce the principle of non-refoulement states are prohibited from returning someone to a country where there is a real risk that he or she will suffer an enforced disappearance. So at least at the international level, we have an anxiety among states that perhaps the refugee definition isn't wide enough. And to resolve that anxiety, what we've done is we've taken the core principle of non-refoulement 
that you must protect someone from return and included it in human rights conventions about torture and forced disappearances, mm. etc. So the story is not so much a story of failure or of lack. It's a story of the need for international solidarity and proper implementation. Okay, wonderful. And could you just tell us as well, when, if ever, does somebody stop being a refugee? Well, if a person is a refugee, then they will cease to be a refugee when they no longer need protection. So the situation changes in the country of origin, the person can go back, the person acquires citizenship of the state where he or she is living, no longer needs to rely on the refugee status because they now have the right to live in another country. So primarily it's about cessation for one reason or another. There are very limited circumstances where someone who's been recognized as a refugee can in fact be sent back to their country of origin and someone who is at risk of torture. This can never apply. But, question mark, what happens to the asylum seeker who says, I was and always have been a refugee, and the state which says, no you're not, prove it to me. I don't believe you. And there I think we have the core of the difficulty. We have differences in recognition rates of asylum seekers from the same countries of origin. I'll take the example of Ahmed's country of origin, Syria, where in some member states, the latest statistics I saw for Europe showed one member state recognizing zero Syrians as refugees, and other member states recognizing 99%. Okay, thank you very much for that really helpful introduction. <coughs> At this point, does anybody have any questions for Elspeth on the legal landscape? Okay, I'll take two questions. Will you wait for the microphone? We've got one here. And then after that, we'll take a question from the lady at the back with her hand up there. So thank in your you. definition, you talked about social groups. So that seems like quite a broad term. So how do, how do legal scholars and governments define it in a way that isn't overly permissive. And we'll take a question from that lady at the back there. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm still not absolutely clear about the difference between asylum seeker and refugee. And also, I'm thinking the five categories, I don't think you included LGBT. Um, and I know a couple of people in that circumstance, so I just was interested to know about the, the legal situation there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Elsbeth, social groups and asylum seeker and refugees. Yes. In terms of the definition of a refugee, race, religion, nationality, membership of a social group and political opinion, social group is the ground for being a refugee, which perhaps has come into its own over the last 15 years. It is the ground that covers people who are being persecuted, not for any of the other reasons, but because the state authorities or indeed non-state actors see them in some way as forming a social group representing views for which the persecutors are willing to persecute them. LGBTI is a classic example of a group which have received refugee status, have been recognized as refugees uh, on the basis of social groups from countries where, for instance, there is um, the criminalization and even the death penalty for LGBTI activities. An asylum seeker becomes a refugee in the eyes of the state when the, refugee, when the state recognizes the refugee as a refugee. So the state recognizes someone who's claimed asylum, the asylum seeker in the eyes of the state, and by recognizing the person, for the state's own purposes, that person is a refugee. So it's as if you arrive, you say, help, I'm going to be persecuted if you sent me back. The state says, yes, please fill in 15 forms, you'll have an interview in two weeks. You fill in the forms, you have your interview, the state says, yes, you are a refugee. Now, in international law, you've always been a refugee. But for the state's purposes, you were an asylum seeker until the state examined your case and decided that you were a refugee, but with that retroactive effect. 
It's as if you arrive at the airport in the UK and you say, I'm a British citizen, but I've lost my passport. And the immigration officer says, well, you probably are, you probably not, I'm not quite sure what to do with you, but here are a whole pile of papers, fill in all these forms, we'll give you an interview in a couple of weeks, and if we can establish you're a British citizen, then you're entitled to be here, and if you're not, we'll send you back to where you came from. Okay, thank you very much, that's great. So I'm going to move on now to ask all our panelists a question, and this is, do you think that the international legal definition is in need of modification? And if so, why? And I'd also like to hear about any problems that you've identified with the processes involved in being recognized as a refugee. So here, I'd like to start with Ahmad. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to talk about practical things. I mean, um, through my experience, you know, working or being a Syrian refugee in some countries in, back in the Middle East and, and the experiences of other um, Syrians. I mean, one of the things that I first came across, you know, after I crossed the Syrian borders into the, the Iraqi Kurdish region, northern Iraq, the first thing um, I met was um, a group of people, you know, um, from officials or we'll see immigration people, they said, you are a guest. So they even did not tell me that you are an asylum seeker or even a refugee. So in northern Iraq, because of the politics of that country, you know, um, I was seen not as an asylum seeker, not as a refugee. When they tell me that you are, you know, as a brother because of my ethnicity, that you're a Kurdish brother who's coming from Syria to Iraq, so it meant that I am at home, that I needed to respect, you know, um, kind of the regulations or whatever uh, rules that they set. But on the other hand, um, they deprived me from kind of, <clears throat> you know, the legal definitions because there was no one there told me that this is, you know, what it means to be an asylum seeker, this is what it means to be a refugee, these are your rights. At the same time, I've had um, family members and friends um, moved into, you know, um, and fled to um, Turkey. And the rhetoric by the officials, you know, in that country, and even, you know, the media was, we are welcoming our brothers and sisters from Syria. So they said they are guests for the time being, you know. And again, if you look on a, on a bigger picture, you know, what is the definition of a guest? What does this mean for me? And um, for how long I'm going to be a guest, you know? And I think in 2013, 11, 12, 13, 14, and later on, the Turkey came with a definition called temporary Protect, I mean, protection, you know, for Syrian refugees. Because, again, they, they kind of understood that the situation in Syria is going to be a protected, you know, protracted, you know, situation. And they need kind of, uh, they, will, they need to look at other, you know, solutions because there's, they cannot, um, you know, kind of send them back to Syria. And for some people, like, being integrated within Turkey is very difficult. So they wanted kind of a resettlement into a third country. So they were introduced the, the kind of um, temporary protection, which was a kind of a way, you know, in order to allow Syrians, you know, some, some Syrians, a window for them to be resettled. So in terms of the definitions, if you go back to the Middle East, you know, um, we were never told that what are our rights, you know. For example, I remember going to some refugee camps, you know, um, in northern Iraq and even in Turkey. When you go and you're, you're after the refugee camp, you know, and you'll, given, you'll be given kind of um, a list, or a piece of paper, which will say, okay, you are a refugee. These are your rights. These are your numbers. These are these emails. And, and they're all technical terms. You do not understand them, you know, and people do not know. And if you go to an official, you say, well, you need to go, um, you know, f ask someone who is kind of, has the right to give you a legal advice. I am not in a position, you know. And then you are in the survival mood. You do not care about all these definitions. All you care about is your family, or, or your kind of instant needs, like food and water and shelter. So I know, of, for example, friends and, and other, you know, um, people who have been living in Turkey for the last five or six years, you know, and they still cannot distinguish between refugee and asylum seeker and a guest or, or whatever. So I think, I believe that there's a deliberate, you know, kind of a policy by some governments, I would say, to, 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 to kind of, to remove this word from the radar because it means for them that they must be 
kind of you know entitled or committed to provide these people with the services. It means um, providing health health care, you know, education care, or or even um, access to to kind of citizenship and other durable solutions. So in the Middle East, at least, I think there's a big big um, kind of lack of understanding of, well, not lack of understanding, a deliberate, you know, kind of obscuring of this, because when you say brothers and sisters uh, and, and guests, it's, it's a vague, it, it has no meaning, you know, and, and you find some political, um, let's say, parties um, using this for their, for their ends. And when it comes to the European, you know, let's say, um, situation, you know, okay, they say refugees and asylum seekers, so they've been hundreds of thousands, you know, um, of refugees and asylum seekers, you know, but still when it comes to, you know, to practice, there's no, no standardization because an African, well, let's say a, a, a person from Eritrea, um, Eritrea could be recognized as a, as a refugee in the UK and not a refugee, let's say, in Finland or, or, or let's say in Sweden. The same thing, you know, a, a Syrian refugee could be recognized in Germany, but not in another. So I think there is a kind of lack of understanding, you know, of, well, I don't know, again, lack of understanding might not be the, the, the right word, but I think there's a lot of confusion, especially after kind of the populist move, you know, and the rise of the right wing in, in, across Europe. And if, if, if you see, you know, um, Donald Trump, for example, or the, the US government, on, on building walls, you know, and, and refugees and, and all this stuff. Who is a refugee, for example? You know, who is a refugee? But again, this is all kind of broad things, but if you bring it back to the single thing about who is a refugee, as you mentioned in your definition, is a person who is fleeing, you know, um, persecution, is, is fleeing after his life, and, and as kind of after World War II, the international community will know we need to protect the refugees because this is kind of a, a duty. But again, because the problem is it's Eurocentric, you know, it always looks at things from a European um, kind of uh, point of view. So it's, it's, it's challenging because even now there have been some people suggesting that we need to modify, you know, um, the refugee um, term to make it more strict. Because it's still already, it's, it's very tough, it's, it's, it's security based you know, a definition, but still they wanted to make it more and more um, kind of strict in terms of who can access the right of being a refugee or not. Thank you very much. And over to Phil, if you could give us a sense of the philosophical debate around this question. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, just before I do that, just to add to the legal complexity, not all states have ratified and signed the UNHCR convention. Mm -hmm. All the 67 protocol. Bangladesh, for example, hasn't ratified it. Um, which is very interesting seeing what's happening in Bangladesh. Sorry, um, apologies. Uh, one legal complication is not all states have si signed and ratified the UNHCR convention or the protocol, and I gave the example of Bangladesh, which hasn't ratified the convention, which is interesting given the situation in Bangladesh at the moment. So that's just to add a kind of extra dimension to the legal complexity. Um, the question, where's the philosophical debate? Actually, interestingly, given uh, what Ahmed just said, there's actually a view in the academic community that we shouldn't actually be discussing this. Um, because, as he said, there, there is, uh, in the political class, in political rulers, they would like to narrow it. Not broaden it, but narrow it. Um, so Theresa May gave a hint recently that she would quite like to have a narrow definition. So. Some academics have suggested it's just not responsible for us to start this debate because we don't know where it's going to go. Um, I don't agree with that. Um, I don't think you can separate academic debates from the public sphere. I think we're in the public sphere, given what's happening about Brexit and, and things like that. Even our lectures are in the public sphere at the moment. So we're not in this kind of sealed off world. We are the public sphere. We're part of it. So I don't agree with that. So if Theresa May might be in the room somewhere, picking up some hints and ideas, but that's, that's the way we go. All right. Um, in terms of content, I think where a lot of theorists are going is looking at the human rights-based approach. So one definition would be something like a refugee is someone who, whose fundamental human rights can't be met without migration. So, so a human rights-based approach, they, fundamental human rights can't be met where they are. They can only have them met if they leave that state. 
Um, if you want to go in that direction, they're very complex questions. You've got to answer what is a fundamental human right? What's going to count? Um, would it be possible to meet those rights in some other way other than migration, such as humanitarian intervention into the territory, in the territory of that state? So there's an argument about what's called alternative to flight strategies. Can we do something which makes flight not necessary? So those two questions, what is a fundamental human right and when is human, humanitarian intervention an obligation, uh, those are very complex. And if you add that to the refugee question, you can see we've got a, a lot of work to do. The other thing I'll add is to do with the inclusion of the refugee voice in this debate, that um, one of the key stakeholders in the debate about who is a refugee is the refugee. Um, and the processes, uh, both political and policy pro processes, I think don't recognize the refugee as a stakeholder. So one interesting thing I'm, I want to look at is how do you include the refugee voice at all levels of this so that they get heard, because they are the key stakeholder here and they're regarded as kind of passive objects, uh, a problem to be solved rather than the people who really have the problem. Um, so how do we include the refugee voice in this process for me is a key question. Okay, thank you. And Elspeth, how would you respond to this question about problems with the existing definition and the processes? Yes, um, I think that one of the things that we need to always bear in mind is that conventions do useful heavy lifting in the field of refugees and in the field of human rights. And that we see the principle of non refoulement being taken up in many more instruments to provide for an ever-increasing number of people. So bearing in mind Phil's comments, I would say we don't need to go back and redefine the refugee. We need conventions that cover more people. So why do we not have a non refoulement provision in respect of people fleeing environmental disaster? Why don't we have, why don't we extend outwards? So instead of opening all the risks of these older conventions where um, there may be some politicians that have got, a, you know, uh, got it under their skin that they really don't like them and instead move forward otherwise. And I think that would perhaps be a better way <coughs> to provide more protection for people who are in need of it. And I think that events like this, one sees that people do recognize and want to protect their neighbors. People from around the world who need to flee to find protection. I don't think that we live in a world where refugees are unwelcome. We live in a world where there's a tremendous cleavage between the people who states say are refugees and who are welcome and the people states say are not refugees, just pretending to be refugees, and whether or not those people are getting a genuine hearing. So how do you see the move of more conventions as improving the prospects for protection over the option of trying to expand the definition of a refugee itself? Why would that be the better move in your view? Well, I think that the Refugee Convention has served us all quite well over time. Yes, we still need more ratifications. Turkey hasn't ratified the Refugee Convention. Bangladesh, we have, we need to keep working on ratifications of the convention. But we have other conventions, like the Convention Against Torture, which is very widely ratified around the world. And so you could say that you are better protected against being sent back to a place where there's a real risk that you will be tortured, because more countries have ratified the convention, than you are to a country where you suffer persecution on a refugee ground. The 2006 Enforced Disappearances Convention is still in the early days of ratification, but it's been signed by most European states, and it provides yet another base. Why could we not have a similar convention for the environment? Okay, thank you very much. So I'll open the floor now to questions. Does anybody have a question about this particular discussion around the existing definitions of a refugee? I'll take a question from Quest over here. Qu oh. Okay, I've got it now. Oh, the, question, the question is uh, economic uh, migrants <coughs> being derided as uh, are not worth anyone's time. Um, I'm sure you understand the, the point and the purpose of the question. So, but how could that, within the realistic idea of our existing uh, 
st uh, political structures? How could we move it a bit and include them as well as what uh, uh, Elspeth said about um, um, climate change um, refugees? What about what, just uh, development refugees too, or lack of development? I'll, uh, where was the other question? Right over here. I'll take this question as well. Uh, thank you all for your insightful comments. Uh, I'm intrigued by Ahmed's comment on uh, refugees being labeled as guests in the Middle East. I completely ag agree that that's such an interesting point. Um, my question then is, given that the majority of the world's refugees are hosted and maintained the, in the global south, uh, do you then suggest that, um, say, countries in the Middle East start extending citizenship for the refugees that are currently there? Or would you suggest that Europe and the US and the global north in ger general takes up more uh, refugees? What, what do you think is a more sustainable solution for the world as it is right now? Thank you. Great. Should we start with Ahmad in response to these yep. questions? Thank you very much. I mean, I'm going to talk about Syria and the Syrian refugee crisis because this is something, you know, um, I am Syrian myself, so I can talk about the situation in the neighboring countries. I mean, if you talk about what you suggested, you know, uh, granting citizenship um, to Syrian refugees, and um, let's say in Lebanon. Um, Lebanon is a country of four million people, and over one million Syrians are living there as refugees. So this is 25% of that entire population. And the majority of them are Arab Sunnis. You know, so politically, this will be a disaster because uh, Christians are very worried, Shia are very worried, other, you know, um, political, you know, um, they are very worried about it because they're going to change, it's going to change the, the dynamics of power in that country. Let's take the case of Turkey, for example. You know, it's a country where about over 80 million people are living there and over 5 million um, Syrians are registered as refugees, you know. Um, Recently, the government of, of, of um, the president of Erdogan, you know, hinted that we are going to give um, citizenship um, to Syrian brothers and sisters. And there was a backlash by Turkish nationalists because they have their fears that uh, the Turkish or Turkishness is being invaded by Arabs, let's say. You've got a fear by Kurdish, you know, ethnicities that they said, well, the government or the AKP government is changing the dynamics for, for political reasons that they're resettling Syrian, you know, um, Arab refugees in Kurdish areas. So I think it is problematic. And I, and I agree, yes, these people, like for five, six years, you've been living in that country and they should have access, you know, to, to at least, you know, um, residence or, or, you know, or citizenship. But again, the politics behind it is very different. I mean, take the case of Palestinians in my country. They fled Palestine in 1948, you know, until today, they got a special ID which says um, a Palestinian Syrian, so which means that you need to go back to your country, though you've never been to that country, you know, you've been living here for, his parents have been living here. So the policy of that country is, is very, very complex. And if you look at the case of Jordan and the clashes, you know, between the the, the Jordanians and, and the Palestinians and the cases of, you know, the, the Israeli-Lebanese um, conflict with the, with, the, with the Palestinian factions and Syria, it's, it's political. It's very problematic. And uh, the one last example, for example, um, the, Kurd the case of Kurdistan region of Iraq, um, where over 250,000 Syrian, mostly Kurdish, ethnics, you know, are living in northern Iraq for the last three, four years. And they say, okay, we are brothers. And they say, okay, we are brothers, so give us the citizenship. But the, the autonomous region cannot do it because it needs to come from Baghdad. So I think politically it, it, it's very difficult to answer this. And, and even resettlement, it's not going to solve the problem because only less than 1% of these refugees, you know, access resettlement. So I think the, the focus should be, okay, life-saving at the moment, the, the, the immediate needs of these people, of local integration, and hopefully thinking about addressing the main causes of the, the problem of why these people are fleeing. Because if you look at the media today, everyone is talking about refugees, but they're addressing the symptoms of the crisis, not the real cause of the problem. If you want to solve it, look at the symptom. I know it's political, it's very complex, but you need to address it because at the first place, I would argue that 99% of these people never ever wanted to leave their country or home. They wanted to stay home and they were forced to flee. Thank you very much. Phil, would you like to respond to those questions? Uh, 
Yeah. Um, on the on the question of, of uh, development refugees, if you like, climate change refugees, I actually am in agreement with Elspeth that what you probably need to look at is not expanding the existing refugee convention, but looking at other conventions to cover uh, internally displaced people and environmentally displaced people. At the moment, what you have is what's called soft law solutions um, to these questions, which are kind of local agreements or guidances. There's no binding international treaties giving these people rights as there are for refugees. So I, what I would want to see is a move towards having some kind of internationally recognized binding legally binding agreements which give these kind of groups protection. So I, I, I am sympathetic with that. On the, on the question of the Global South, Global North relationship, um, what we know is, you know, we know the figures about 84% of refugees being hosted in the Global South. Um, the Global North really is making, is putting as many obstacles as possible to people getting to the Global North to claim asylum. We know what Italy is doing with the Libyan, uh, various Libyan, Libyan organizations to make it harder for people to come across the Mediterranean. They've been largely successful. The numbers crossing the Mediterranean have fallen because of these measures. Um, how many people are, are dying because of these measures, we don't know. We know the number who die in the Mediterranean. We don't know how many die trying to get to the Mediterranean. Um, so we know the Global North is doing its best to stop people getting to safety because one of the, I think one of the problems with the convention okay we have the non refoulement um, condition which you have the right not to be sent back to danger but you don't have the right to escape danger um, so the question of safe passage how you provide safe passage for people becomes absolutely crucial thank you Asbeth Yes, I must say um, we're going to be in, um, uh, in agreement on quite a number of things. So I, I would just add on the question of the difference between an economic migrant and a refugee. And the key is, does this person need protection from what will happen to him or her in the country of origin? So if the person is going to suffer torture or persecution in the country of origin, be it for an economic reason, a development reason, or whatever, then that person, in my view, should be entitled to protection in another country. We have the whole problem of the non-entree policies, uh, promoted very much by Europe and North America. If nobody can get to your borders, then nobody can apply for asylum. <coughs> And I think that's a very, very substantial problem that needs to be dealt with. Fortunately, it's not the whole world. It's only parts of the world, mind you. The Rohingya trying to get to Bangladesh weren't exactly having a very easy time of it. But I think that we need to address that from the call <coughs> in the development world for responsible border controls. And I think that if we want to think about responsible border controls in the international community, then we have to think very carefully about what border controls should be. Responsible border controls are not those which create death at the border or on the way to the border. Okay, thank you very much. I'll take a couple more questions now and then we'll move on. I see one over there, that man at the back there. Yes, you. Wave your hand so they know who you are. <laughs> yes, great. And we'll take one here at the front afterwards. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, my question from the panel, what do you think, do you believe that international community has done its job proper uh, regarding about the refugee? Because I believe, uh, which I think, the more responsible international community for the responsibility of the refugee, what happened disaster in the Syria or like in Afghanistan or some other country. So why first we look at why the people they coming be refugee? And my another question is that regarding which Ahmad then mentioned about neighbors. It's more responsible not belongs to the people which they involve in the country and they like in the war inside in the country. Like I can, I can say like Syria. They're not involved like for example NATO or Russia they're involved in there. 
so they get more responsibility for these people. At least they take a, like people as a refugee, or make a stop in the war in this country, or make a, some another solution for them. And instead, they go people um, to get a refugee for another country. So was that second question? Yeah, that's my who, second who question. Who should take responsibility? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then we have a question here at the front. I'm just wondering whether those powers who create refugees, for instance, like United States, you say, or the Israeli lobby, for instance, in Iraq, uh, the Americans have created in Libya the problems, the refugees, or in case of Iraq, you see now the position is. And so in Syria, where aiding and abetting by uh, the uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, those Gulf states, you see, Dubai, or the Abu Dhabi, are they not responsible for creating unnecessary refugees? The Syria was decimated, you see, by where, of course, the Assad was not a but it could have been resolved with a, some sort of negotiation and resolution. But this was deliberately created under the auspices of the United States. Something that must be held responsible for creating massive refugee status all over the world. Thank you very much. So we have the question about has the international community done its job properly and about who is responsible for creating and responding to refugee flows. So we'll start this time with Elspeth. Yes, the international community and responsibility for refugees. One of the difficulties that we have as a world is that we want a strong international community, we want strong international institutions, but we also want strong sovereign states which are able to uphold human rights. Now these two um, desires which we have are not antagonistic. The international community is made up of states. If states are failed states, <laughs> Somalia being an example, they're not upholding anybody's human rights. Uh, and, of course, Somalia is a substantial refugee-producing country. So, yes, we need strong states, but then we need also states which are strong enough to stand up and to comply with the international obligations which they have undertaken. That must be seen as part of the responsibility of being a sovereign state in an international community. And one of those obligations is to behave in a manner of solidarity towards refugees. One of the things which I think we need to really take into account if we want to move the framework and the mindset about refugees, which we have at the moment in many parts of Europe, is to remember that <coughs> refugees are a terrific opportunity for states which embrace them, invite them in, treat them well. They become part of the future of the state where they settle. Refugees are not a burden on host, host communities. Thank you. Ahmed. Yeah, thank you very much for your questions. And I think you raised a very important question about, well, the international community. As a Syrian person, if you go today and ask any Syrian person, okay, what is the international community is doing? He would, the first thing he would ask you, okay, who is the international community? What is their postcode? Who are they? Where are they? Where can I meet them? Literally, I mean, who are they? Who, I mean, how does this work, you know? And because we are living today in the 21st century, in a country, you know, in the last five years, in a country where 22 million people have left, today, and according to the recent figures in Syria, half a million people got killed. They lost their lives, you know? Over two million people, you know, got injured. About Seven million people are internally displaced, I mean, multiple displacements. You know, over five million people are taking refuge in the neighboring countries. Um, and about three million children are out of education today. This all happened between 2011 and 17, and we are praising about how, you know, how advanced and this world has become, you know. And again, you say the international community, and I, 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 when it comes to responsibility, I would say, um, it, it's, 
it's terrible what happened in Syria, what happened in Afghanistan, what's happened in Iraq, what happened in, 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 in you know, um, and, in Eritrea and other parts. And I think when it comes to the international community, you know, um, dealing with dictators, de dealing with criminals, because um, you've got, you know, um, there are no alternatives. They, they, they just, they, they got to, to the point that if the dictator goes, it means that the whole structure will fall. The case of Iraq, for example, Saddam Hussein is gone. Iraq is gone. Gaddafi is gone. Um, you know, um, kind of um, Libya is gone. They say, okay, if Assad is gone, Syria will be gone. So I believe that the international community did not stand up into its, into its responsibility into building, you know, kind of um, institutions that would ensure that if these dictators, these butchers leave, that they, they could stand up. And again, um, I mean, I'm going to, to talk about, again about Syria, for example, um, when it comes you know, to the neighboring countries and the politics. I think when it all started in 2011, the, the borders between Syria and Turkey, they were open. They said, okay, your brothers and sisters, come and live with us. But after two years or one year and a half, they realized that this is going to be a protected situation. And they started building walls and, you know, it, it became problematic. And even like in 2012 and 13, there was like a, a massive, massive international gathering by the international community. They formed a group, Friends of Syria, with about 100, 100 something, you know, governments came together to help Syrians. And one funny example, when Khan Shikhoun in Idlib province was attacked by a chemical weapon, you know, a weapon, uh, we've seen Donald Trump going to TV and say, well, we are so sorry about, you know, the, 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 the destiny uh, and, and the horrible, you know, um, death of little baby children in Syria who were killed by uh, criminals. Two days later, or, or even like one week, uh, and two hours later, he said, well, we are not taking in any Syrian refugees, not any refugees from seven, you know, Muslim countries. I mean, this contradiction is, is beyond imagination. You know, it's, 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 it's crazy. I mean, these are very scary times to be a refugee. You know, I remember friends, for example, you know, um, when we kept beyond red doors up, up north in that country, we, we put in something, you know, kind of a badge in our hand just because we happened to be refugees like, you know, like the David Starr, um, one of the, the Jewish um, refugees. And um, I think I'm... I would say again, I mean, who, who, who to blame? Uh, first of all, I would, we blame ourselves, Syrians, because we started it, but today we cannot stop it, because it's not about us anymore. And I do blame the media. I would blame, um, again, the, the conscious world, you know, that um, let this happen. The, 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 and I would also blame the, 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 the weapon companies, the media giants who, who deceived us, and they stole um, our dream, you know, of, 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 of just living as, as a human being, just right with, 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 without being feared or, or tortured. But I think, yeah, um, we've learned, so we, I think, we, yeah, we've learned, but it was too late for us. I mean, what does that mean? Um, Thank you. Bill. Thanks. Um, on the causal responsibility question, I, I think I go with uh, Joseph Karens, who's a, a, a great theorist of uh, the ethics of migration, where he says there are kind of three rationales here for taking in refugees. One is purely humanitarian, one's causal responsibility, and the third one, which he says is probably the right one, is it's to do with the international state system. So refugees are created by the failure of the state system and if states have an interest in that system working, then all states have an equal responsibility to take refugees. So it's an international responsibility to take them wherever they come from. Uh, the problem with the causal responsibility argument, though it's tempting to, to, aim, to aim at certain states, is that another state can say, look, they're not our problem. We didn't do anything. It's their problem over there, so we're not going to take them in. So some people are very cautious to be included about that, although it has a, 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 an attraction. On the international community... Um, the, the point is that the international community is failing on this. Um, the UNHCR has three durable solutions to uh, the refugee situation. One is uh, repatriation, where refugees go home. Uh, the other is local integration, giving citizen, citizenship. The other is resettlement. And if you look at the numbers, um, in all of those, if you combine them all, probably less than 10% of refugees are moving through any of those. Uh, systems. They are, they are really stuck 
where they are. So the international community is, is failing um, in that sense. So we have to rethink how, how can we undo this logjam where the vast majority of refugees are simply stuck uh, in refugee camps. Um, Ahmed mentioned protracted situations, protracted refugee situations, which I think more than half the refugee population are what are defined as protracted refugee situations. That is a situation where no one can see when it's going to end. And the average one now, I recently looked, it's 26 <coughs> years. 26 years is your average time of a protracted refugee situation. Um, so we're stuck and the international community is, is failing. Thank you very much. So well, now we move into the final part of our discussion. And I want to mention a 1985 article with the title, Who is a Refugee? by a philosopher, Andrew Shacknove. And in that article, he says, interestingly enough, in a sense, being a refugee is a kind of privileged status when compared to lots of people who are on the move or indeed who are not on the move because they're stuck where they are and that many people would like to have the rights attached to the status of a refugee. So I want to come back to our question and ask the panel, who do you think is a refugee? Would you prefer an expanded definition, perhaps a specific one, that includes more people who are on or indeed not even on the move? Do you think that any attempt to distinguish between refugees and others is going to be in some sense problematic? And do you think in practice that any attempt to try and expand this definition is going to be futile or lead to more problems. I know we've touched on some of these issues already, but I want to start with Phil here. Could you round up for us on this question? Thank you. Um, yeah, I want, to, I want to go back to, to where you started with the, the way uh, uh, various organizations distinguish between refugees and migrants. Um, and there are certain, because uh, in asking the question who is a refugee, we're also at the same time asking the question, who is not a refugee? Uh, and how we answer one question will affect the other question. And basically what we're saying, as, as, as Elsa was pointed out earlier, that if we're going to have uh, a definition of the refugee, we're saying the refugee has a set of international uh, protections, which the people who fall outside the definition, they're not going to have. So what are we going to do about those, that, that group? Um, and environmental climate change is certainly a key one, which I think is very, very challenging. Uh, internally displaced persons, a very important one. But I think the economic migrant, I mean, the economic migrant is often the villain of this piece. And, and, and if you've got to distinguish between refugees, and it's the economic migrant who, who gets um, the finger pointed at them. And, and again, we go back to, to, to what you said at the start, Sarah, that the standard definition is, it, distinction is um, the economic migrant chooses to move. Um, uh, to improve their lives. And if you look at, at the people who, f who fall under the category of being economic migrants who are f fleeing extreme <coughs> poverty uh, and deprivation, to say they, they're not forced to move is really doesn't stand up for more than a split second. It's, it just will depend on a very tendentious <coughs> definition of what it is to be forced to move. So we have to be aware of both sides of this question, I think. Um, I, I go back to Elspeth's point, though, you don't have to expand the definition to include all these groups, as long as we say something about them and have maybe different conventions and different agreements to cover them. So it's not necessarily going to be uh, an endlessly expanding project uh, of the current definition. However, having said that, there's still a lot to, of work to do on the, the refugee definition itself, because it is target-based, it is persecution-based, and we, what we know is the vast majority of people fleeing military violence are not necessarily targets of that violence. They're just in the way. They're not being <coughs> persecuted directly. Um, so there are other definitions around this. The Cartagena definition of refugee for Latin America, which is much more close to our kind of average view of who a refugee is. The African Union has a much more generous definition it works with. So I think um, to stick with what we've got, there's, there's still a lot of work we need to do with it. It is, in one sense, it's a product of the history. It was written during the Cold War to address a Cold War issue, actually. And one of my students, when we were discussing this a couple of weeks ago, says it looks like a kind of global north definition. It doesn't look like a definition which applies globally. 
Um, so I think we do have to look at it and do have to revise it. <coughs> Thank you. Elspeth. Yes. I think that um, what I would want to add here is that what we really need are good rights, well described, that apply to people who are in need of international protection, who are at risk of non refoulement but who are not refugees. So they may be people whose right to non refoulement comes from the real risk of torture, the forced disappearance, etc. And their rights are not set out in these international conventions. So they get only the non refoulement and then they don't get, for instance, rights to equality, right to work, um, you know, right to all of the things which are so important to building a new life in a new country. So I think that building in these rights is going to be one of the keys. And the other thing which I think is terribly important, if we're going to come to terms with providing protection to those people who need it, is proper and generous implementation by states. Thank you. Ahmed. I think given the current political situation, I would, person, I would go that the least we could do today is at least to stick to the current refugee convention because if we lose it, we lose it. Because globally there is no consensus, you know. Look, look what's happening in the U.S. in this country and beyond. I mean, there is no consensus whatsoever, you know, in that country. So I would say, you know, um, losing the current, you know, um, the Refugee Convention with all its imperfections, you know, um, um, would be a disaster. So at least maintaining it, you know, with all its problems still would be um, kind of um, a plus for, 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 for many, many people. I would save um, millions um, of lives. Um, one thing I really would like to, to talk about when it comes to this, um, you know, refugees and um, because this is an, an experience that I, I've been through, you know, um, um, between Turkey and the, when, when I made it to Greece, you know, um, you started, you feel like even when it comes to the definition of a refugee, uh, it's kind of categorization and classification. So it's a very trendy thing to be a Syrian refugee in Europe. Honestly, but it's very problematic if you are a refugee, let's say from Eritrea or Ethiopia or even Afghanistan. I know it's political, but again, like this discrimination, you know, um, between refugees that you're Syrian, you are from this, you are from that, and um, it's problematic. It's creating divisions, you know, among these people. Because I remember, like, I'm, I'm on one of the uh, um, Greek islands, there were like two refugee camps where Syrians are kept here. I would say like in five stars, refugee camps and, and, and kind of um, other nationalities. I mean, this separation was problematic, was creating a lot of hatred. And I think it's kind of a tool by some policymakers because it's creating division and it's kind of steering the attention from the main problem into kind of trivial um, um, things. And again, in terms of, of, yeah, would you like it to, to be kind of, um, be kind of, you know, um, redefined or, or modified yes it should be kind of because at the end of the day this is a humanitarian crisis you know and for many many of these people are fleeing wars and, and, and dictatorships and persecution it is a humanitarian crisis um, you know and I do appreciate the, the the security concerns you know in Europe in the US all over the globe with the rise of terrorism and ISIS these governments or these states you know uh, they do have the right to take um, you know kind of security measures but again, you, everything, you cannot make everything you know, related to security. But I, I understand this is how the, the politics of, of, of the states um, 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 work. Um, and again, when, when global, if you look at the numbers, and again, this is kind of, you know, in a world where over, around over 6 billion people are living and about 65 million refugees and internally displaced people, it's about, that number is nothing. Today we are very rich. I mean, and if you look at Europe, you know, over 500 million people are living there, the biggest economic, political, you know, block on earth. They're making all this fuss about the refugee crisis in 2015. They called it a crisis. Lebanon, you know, um, Turkey, Iraq, and Jordan, they've been dealing with it for, for years and years, and they did not make a fuss about it. You know, 
So and again, I'm, I, I, I would really appreciate kind of a, a new approach to look at it from a humanitarian you know, perspective, um, not from a Eurocentric, you know, to like, um, and again, to involve the refugees, because if you never feel the pain, it's very difficult. Yeah, I, I meet some people who meet me, so yeah, I understand what you've been through. You will never understand it. You've never seen a person being turned into pieces in front of your eyes. You would never, you know, you've never seen a person, um, you know, being beheaded in front of your eyes. You've never seen a father throwing his, his, his wife, you know, and his children, into the sea because he wanted to save one little child. You've never seen this. How on earth you could understand this? You need to involve these people and you, may, you need to make it more humane. And more importantly, you know, um, if there were kind of policies on, I mean, on place, you know, to prevent, you know, the main causes of this problem, you wouldn't have this problem in, 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 in Europe. There wouldn't be a crisis. And, and I, it's, it's a problem because they, they call it a crisis. I do not see it as a crisis. I see it as a pure golden opportunity. There was recently a book um, called Refuge by Alexander Betts and, and Paul Collier. And they mentioned that 50% of Syrians with, with university and treaty you know, degree are today in Europe. These are the most intelligent you know, um, people in that country today are in Europe. Doctors, engineers, you know, all these people are there. This country is going to make uh, these people are going to make a lot of contributions. I mean, take the case of Germany, for example. You know, over 4,000 Syrian doctors are living today in Germany. Imagine how much money it would cost Germany, let's say, from the day the doctor is born to the day he is graduated. And suddenly, you have three up to 4,000 doctors ready-made. You just need one, two de you know, years um, training and go. And the, the, the joke about it, and um, I remember in 2003, 15 or it was 16. Donald Trump, for example, was saying, we're going to build walls and we're going to prevent refugees from coming in. And the joke was that he was tweeting about it from, from his iPhone. And the very iPhone that he was using was created by a son of a Syrian migrant, Steve Jobs. I mean, Steve Jobs was the son of a Syrian migrant. I mean, I cannot understand the logic behind this. Yeah, I follow that. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think that is uh, just quickly two points. One thing is remembering this question who is a refugee? Is, it's not about numbers, it's not about definitions, it's about the life people are leaving as refugees. What is it to be a refugee? And unless we get our heads around what it is to be a refugee, we're not really getting to grips with it. Um, so that's really important. So the Exodus series, I think, was a major step in getting that across to people. But I just wanted to add something about the people who, whose rights are being left out of the debate, and that's asylum seekers. Because um, the treatment of asylum seekers in the UK is absolutely disgraceful. It's a scandal, what's happening to asylum seekers. They have no rights, apart from having their case heard. Don't have, they can't work, they, they're kept on very low uh, allowances. Many of them have been kept in a t detention centres. Um, so let's not forget the rights of asylum seekers here. Thank you. So I'd like to open to questions from the audience now on anything that we've heard so far. Um, there's a lady over there. Can you wave your hand so we know who you are? Thank you. And then we'll take a question over here. It was mentioned that uh, refugees are, by definition, uh, people who are basically fleeing uh, uh, torture, violence, or any form of uh, um, non-human treatment to actually seek refuge in a country where treatment, good treatment and, uh, is provided and rights are protected. Um, the main issue that is very much undermined, especially uh, in the West, uh, when we talk about specifically the Syrian refugee crisis, is that uh, the country which has the highest refugee per capita in the world, which is Lebanon, is hosting um, an exceeding number of refugees and is not basically providing them with their rights. Uh, so the issue here is to also talk about um, the, um, uh, the situation whereby refugees are fleeing uh, a country that is not considered safe to go to another country uh, where they are not feeling safe. 
And the result is that European countries are providing a lot of funds and INGOs are basically establishing themselves and uh, providing um, a source of income to many foreigners who would actually go and live in the Middle East. Uh, whilst they are blocking the borders. And then they accuse uh, countries like Lebanon of uh, lack of freedom, which I agree of, but then the contradiction and the irony, as you have also discussed, is that um, you know, like refugees are basically uh, used as a tool by both uh, uh, states that lack uh, uh, basic freedoms and democracy, but also uh, states that claim to be very democratic and developed. Thank you. And the second question? Um, thank you for your contributions, um, they were all valuable. And my question is somehow related to the first question. Um, so, Ms. Gild has talked about uh, the registration process of a refugee in, let's say, U the UK. Um, a refugee arrives in uh, the airport and it takes about two weeks for them to be, uh, for their forms to be processed. But, what, but, in, Tur but in Turkey, um, it's quite of a mess and the refugees who arrive in Turkey are not given a clear status and it takes uh, a long time for them to be registered or uh, it takes a lot of um, diplomatic um, steps for them to be um, seen as refugees. Uh, my point here is, so it's to all of you, um, when Turkey has about 5 million refugees and Europe has only about 1.5 million refugees, do you think it's feasible for Turkey to spare that time registering every refugee and spending that amount of uh, labor on registering every refugee one by one? And, uh, when, and when refugees come to the Turkish border in masses, in hundreds of thousands of people at one time, but when Whereas in the UK or in France or in Germany, they come in airports and they are uh, coming in the airports with smaller numbers. Is it possible for Turkey to monitor this process um, easily? And I know that Turkey has a bad record of uh, dealing with the refugee crisis, but do you think that uh, the 3 billion euros that were given to, the U to Turkey by, by the European Union to solve the refugee crisis is enough? Because I personally think it's not enough, and I do think that Turkey has a bad, bad record, but Europe is not doing enough to help Turkey deal with the process. Thank you. Thank you. So the rights and registration of refugees in countries like Lebanon and Turkey. Elspeth. Yes, I would start with uh, the bad practices of the European Union, including ourselves here in the UK. And that is the attempt to create a principle out of the idea that refugees are not entitled to secondary movement. And secondary movement is, for instance, a Syrian who's in Lebanon, who's got <coughs> virtually nothing, and who moves on to the UK or to elsewhere in Europe. And this idea of onward movement, a secondary movement, as being the most heinous crime that a refugee can possibly uh, commit is one of, it is a true shame for all of us. Of course, refugees who are not receiving proper protection and reception where they are must be entitled to move on to receive that protection elsewhere, and particularly that reception. This idea that this is somehow an ignoble secondary movement should be expunged from our way of thinking about refugees and asylum seekers. And that includes in respect of refugees who are also moving on from Turkey, a, uh, a system where you have a fairly sclerotic asylum system, very much like Greece where decisions just aren't being taken. Of course people should be able to move on. Of course they shouldn't be expected to remain in horrific conditions in a state which is unwilling, unable, or just not doing its job in terms of providing them with uh, reception. And I think that when we speak of responsibility sharing around the world, one of the things which we must bear in mind is that the people who are suffering are those who are entitled to our responsibility even when they're moving onwards from somewhere which perhaps they're not being persecuted, but where they still need protection. And group protection for them, I think, is a very easy solution as well. So should we always think of, of 
the category of refugee is related to the, con to the situation in the country of the person's habitual residence or citizenship, or can their refugee status be related to the country in which they're currently residing, e.g. Turkey or Lebanon in that kind of case? Well, of course, in Turkey or Lebanon, neither state has ratified the Refugee Convention, so they're not refugees in either of those two countries because the two countries don't have the status. Instead, they're providing um, a temporary protection scheme in Turkey in particular, um, a series of different kinds of schemes in Lebanon, but they are not refugees. Durable solutions mean refugees have protection. <coughs> Uh, I, I, I won't comment on, on Turkey, actually. It's just go back to what you said about the UK, that the asylum seeker arriving at UK airport will have their case dealt within two weeks. I'd like to know who that is, because they don't. It can take years, years and years to get refugee status in the UK. Uh, and people go through a tremendous fight. The, U, the UK getting refugee status is a very hard slog, and it can take a very long time. <coughs> Yeah, um, to answer your question, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to directly answer your question, if, if, and even if I understood it correct, but I do agree. I mean, in terms of, of Lebanon, Lebanon has done a tremendous job uh, because they hosted over one million people, you know, and if you look at the politics that of that country, Syria has occupied that country um, for, for a long time. There's a lot of grievances for, for from different parts, you know, of the, the society. So I agree, uh, um, it's problematic. But again, if, if you look um, um, at the refugees, and, and, and let's again, let's, let's just remove all these figures and numbers, you know, they are faceless. Who is a refugee? At the end of the day, a refugee is a human being. He's a father, he's a mother, he's a student, he's an engineer, he's a lover, um, he's a dreamer, he's an entrepreneur. Is just a person because of, 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 of the current situation in his home. You know, he, he, he fled and he cannot go back. So as a human nature, you know, okay, when you are um, in, the, in the kind of the survival mood, all you care about is food, water, and shelter, the survival, you know, needs. But again, as a human being, you do care about, you know, not only, I mean, surviving, but striving. I mean, there are many, many people, you know, here in this... Um, um, in this room who came from Australia or came from, 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 from Mozambique or came from uh, Morocco or even from Lebanon, why you're here? Because, uh, because you, want to, you want to thrive, you need to, to, to get an education, you need a better future. You know? And I think this is the same applies uh, to refugees or whatever, if you, because if you remove the word of refugee, it could be me, it could be you, it, well, it's already me, so it could be you or whatever. So, you know, and again, um, it's very important to, 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 to focus on this because a lot of people say, okay, well, these are refugees and, 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 and they're, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of, in, a, in, a, in a, a very difficult situation. But again, for, for how long? Because if you sit there in the, in a, you know, at the refugee camp waiting for help, it will never come. It will never come. And this is why the, this definition between bad refugees and good refugees come from if you wait patiently, hoping that you'll be resettled, you know, through the UN, you know, and again, this is a very, 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 I mean, the, the likelihood that you'll be receiving is very, very, very small. But if you make the, the journey yourself, then you will be accused of being, you know, um, a queue jumper or, 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 or whatever. You know, it's, it's just really problematic because whatever you do, you will be blamed of. I mean, because, I mean, again, just give you like on, on a practical level in, in many countries, and this is a lot of refugees, you know, and an asylum seekers face, for example, if you, um, if you go to work, where you're living as, as an asylum seeker or, let's say, refugee. If you go to work, people would accuse you of stealing their jobs. If you do not go to work, people accuse you of sitting and, you know, abusing their hospitality. So it's problematic. It's really problematic. And the policy behind it is, 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 is really um, um, very, very problematic. I'm commenting on, on your point of, of Turkey. If you ask me as a Syrian person, how do you see this? Well, see, look, Gaddafi, in the old days, he used to threaten Italy. They look, I'm going to open the borders. So humans were used as, you know, bargaining chips. If I'm not happy, I'm just going to open the border. Okay, here are 20, 30 boats. In 2015, there was a, 
a study done, I think, by the University of Oxford, where they mentioned that in Turkey alone, over 500 million US dollars were generated from smuggling. I mean, if you use your mind and if you use your logic, you can smuggle one, two, three, 20, 1,000 people. You cannot smuggle half a million people. This is, I mean, this is illogical. It means that there is a systematic policy by some governments, because to play this, because you give me money, okay, I'll look after it. And I've, the way that I see it, and they've mentioned that in refuge, that because they are coming from Muslim majority countries, that look, I'll take you, I'll give you the money, you keep them and deal with it. This is your problem. I mean, this is um, kind of more blatantly how, how I'm going to put it. Okay, I'll take a couple more questions. Uh, that lady there with the grey jumper and behind the lady with the black jumper. Hi. Uh, I wanted to talk about clandestinity because I think that before when we talked about the fact that there is no bureaucratic path for, for example, economic migrants, like, inter like I mean, like environment migrants or development migrants, I think that a big issue in that case is clandestinity because I think that at a certain point when migrants, I'm from Italy, for example, and when migrants arrive to Italy and after a while they find out that there is no bureaucratic path for them because they're not there for international protection or for subsidiarity protection or whatever, they understand that their request will be rejected and so they turn to clandestinity and from there to human trafficking or to other like issues like that. And for me it's crazy that those governments that condemn those illegal, pa like those illegal trafficking and, thing and things like that are the first through regulations and institutions to push that peop the people into the arms of those, of those situations. Okay, thank you. The problem of clandestine migrants and the lady, yeah? Hello, um, I would like to ask a um, question in regards to the rise of um, extreme right and racism th to the question, with the question to refugees. I come from Eastern Europe and um, whenever I had this conversation, sometimes I really, s uh, encountered a real wave of um, of oh, but they should go to um, the countries where they have more cultural similarity. So I want to ask you, and and my question, my answer was, but look at it as a human being, as from the humanitarian point of view. But not always it kind of fell on the fertile soil. So from I wonder, from your personal experiences, um, what would be how did you, wh whenever you had these conversations, what was the best way to persuade somebody um, about the right cause? If, if, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll put those two questions to the panel, and if you'd like to give us your final word for tonight, we'll start with Elspeth. Thank you. Yes. What to do about irregularly present migrants? One of the things which the Council of Europe is particularly concerned about is how to ensure that irregularly present migrants can actually <laughs> access the human rights to which they are entitled. Access to, uh, to housing, to food, to health care, to education, to <coughs> labor protection rights if insofar as they may be working. And I think this is one of the issues that we absolutely have to come to terms with. And we'll need the international community to recognize its obligations in respect of irregularly present migrants to their human rights in the same manner as anyone else is entitled to them. And to move away from ideas like the creation of a hostile environment to force people to leave or starve to death on the streets. In respect of the extreme right and racism, I'm extremely cognizant of our worries about Europe at the moment, our worries about certain results in elections. And I think that one of the things that we must take very seriously is the role of public leadership in respect of the rise of the far right and racism. This doesn't come from nowhere. This comes from public leadership which makes acceptable <clears throat> a whole series of ways of talking about other people which are at least covert 
discrimination, if not over discrimination. We need our public officials to be much more responsible in the ways in which they talk about refugees and migrants. And finally, I would end once again with the plea, can we please look at refugees as a magnificent opportunity for our future? Thank you. Phil. Um, I, little to, to add to that, I think Elspeth is absolutely right. The, the refugee question has been used as a political tool by the, the right in all sorts of places, not just in Eastern Europe, but in the UK during the Brexit campaign. Um, so we know it's been exploited. So some degree of responsibility certainly falls upon our political leadership um, on irregular migrants we know yes the UK and other states have been using a deterrence uh, policy which hits not just uh, uh, the undocumented but those who would be refugees so it's hitting all, all parties um, so we need to move away from a deterrence approach that's really dominating uh, politics at the moment thank you in the last minute to Ahmad yeah I mean to talk about Irregular migrants, I mean, this is beyond my remit, so I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to address this. Hopefully one day, if I become an expert on this, I'll, I'll address it. But on the issue of racism and, and xenophobia, I mean, my personal experience in the last years um, that has been in this country, and even from other friends, has been a fantastic experience. The media, you know, because the news at the end of the day all about fears, you know. If there's no fear, there's no problems, if there's no worries, I mean, the news won't work. The radio or newspapers won't work. The Daily Mail won't work. So, you know, so, and again, I mean, there were recently, I think it was last year or something, Amnesty International, you know, they did a survey in Russia and in Spain and the UK, and about 70% of people, and the question was, would you welcome a refugee in your country? About 70% of people said yes. This is fascinating because at the end of the day, you, the, the, it was simple. It was like you're, you're, you're kind of want to help a, a human being at the end of the day. And um, my experience has been a great experience. I came to this country within 90 days, I got my refugee status. Um, yeah, initially I was detained, which was fine for two, three days, but I mean, even the detention center was great compared to the Syrian prisons, you know, like, it was really great. So, yeah, 90 days ago, I'm a refugee status, and after that, I got a scholarship, you know, um, from, from SAWAS and the Said Foundation within the UK to, 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 to finish my master's in violence, conflict, and development. And then I, I managed to bring over my family. So things worked out very well for me. I lived with an English family for over five months. So it's been a great experience. And then again, um, it's the people, it's the, the normal human beings. In 2015, I remember the, the head of the, the UK government, at that time was David Cameron, who said, we are not taking in any Syrian refugees. We are the second biggest you know, um, international donors when it comes to the Syrian refugee crisis. We are not taking in any Syrian refugees. And suddenly, we had the, the, the picture of that little child, Aylan Kurdi, you know, washed up the, the, the Syrian, uh, um, the Turkish shore. And there was a massive, massive, you know, of, of public interest that, no, we need to do something. And within 24 hours or one week, the UK said, we are taking in 20,000 Syrian refugees. Just overnight from the same person who said, no, we are not taking one single person. So and again, it's about the public leadership. It's, it's about the human beings. If you look at the politicians, who are they? The other people who me, you and others, we, you know, we elected. They need us. Not, not that we need them. They do need us. So I think um, raising awareness, making it personal is very important because 65 million people. No, it's not 65 million people. It's one human being. It's a mother. It's a father. It's, they just make it personal. We need to build this relational you know, relationship. It's, it's, it's the human being. It's not these faceless figures. And, I, and again, and this is an institution and others, I think I have a, a great, great hope in the youth, in, in, in the group, you know, in, especially at, at, as university um, students, because you guys are going to be the, 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 the force beyond change. In five, ten years, you know, you will be the leaders of this country and beyond. So you got the opportunity to, 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 to bring about change. So seize the opportunity.
Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to this fantastic panel. And I'll just end with quoting Ahmad al Rashid's words Who is a refugee? A refugee is a human being. Thank you very much. Good night. Yeah, just one thing. Um, I just, you know, on behalf of, of many, many, many Syrians, thank you very much, you know, for taking the time of to being here. It means a lot for, for many people. It means that people are interested. So thank you very much for your time.